Hey, everybody. We've already talked about sets in a previous lecture, and today I'd like to discuss two things. The first thing I'd like to talk about is how we can perform operations on sets to obtain other sets. The second thing that I'd like to emphasize is that there's a very nice correspondence between set operations on sets and Boolean operations on propositions. This will allow us to translate everything we've already done about propositions into statements about sets as well. And we can also go in the other direction and translate statements about sets into statements about propositions. That's what we'll talk about today. Throughout this lecture, we will always assume that there's a universal set U and that A, B, C, etc. are all subsets of this same universal set U. We define the union of A and B to be all points that are either in A or in B or both. It's like an inclusive OR. We define the intersection of A and B to be all points that are in both A and B. The complement of A is the set of all points not in A. The set A minus the set B is the set of all points in A that are not in the set B. Here is a super, super, super important point that's not always stressed. When we discuss the complement of a set A, we are implicitly assuming a particular universal set U that A lives in. If we change the universal set U, the complement can change. Here's an example. Let's consider A to be the set of even integers. We then ask, what is the complement of A? Well, it really depends on where we think of A as living inside. For example, if our universal set is the integers, then the complement of A is the set of odd integers. However, if our universal set is the real numbers, then the complement of A is the set of odd integers plus any real number that's not an integer. So again, the choice of U matters when it comes to complements. Recall our claims in an earlier worksheet that we can prove logical equivalences by using Venn diagrams. The converse of this is also true. We can prove statements about sets by translating them into statements about propositions as well. For example, let P and Q be propositional functions on a universal set U. Define the sets A and B as follows. A is the set of X where P of X is true, and B is the set of X where Q of X is true. Then let's go ahead and compute. A union B, by definition, is all of the X's in U, such that X is in A or X is in B. Again, I'm meaning inclusive or here. Which means it's all of the X's in U, such that P of X is true or Q of X is true, which is just the logical or of P and Q. So the proposition that corresponds to the union is the or. We can prove a similar correspondence between intersection and and, and with complement and not. Also notice that subset corresponds to implication. A is a subset of B means that X in A implies X in B, which in this language means P of X implies Q of X. We can flip all this around though. Imagine that we start with any two sets A and B inside a universal set U. Now we can define P and Q in terms of A and B. We can define P of X to be true if X is in A and false if X is not in A, and the same sort of thing for Q. If X is in B, we say Q is true. If X is not in B, we say Q is false. From this, any operation on logical propositions can be translated to an operation on sets and vice versa. We can go back and forth however we like, whenever it's convenient. Okay, here's a few examples. Let's let A be the set that contains circle, square, triangle, star, and B is the set that contains circle, star, pentagon. Then A intersect B is circle, star. A minus B is square, triangle. Now notice if I take the union of A intersect B and A minus B, I recover the set A. Is this always true? Similarly, 
we can think of sets of real numbers, and in particular intervals. If we let A be the interval 1 to 5, closed on the left, open on the right, and B be the interval 1 to 7, open on the left, closed on the right, then for example we can compute all of these things. A union B is the closed interval 1 to 7, etc, etc, etc. Here's a theorem with a lot of identities about sets. So let's just list them here. And for the record, some of these are quite easy to prove, and some are a bit more complicated. But one can prove all of them using basically the definitions of these operations. And no worries, you'll get some practice because proving all of these will be on one of your home upcoming homework assignments. But let me also point out that there's a parallel set of logical identities that you can see on the other side. Anyway, these are basically all the identities that don't use complements, and they're all in one place. And that brings us to the next scene, where we write down some of the identities that do use complements. And here they are. We will prove a couple of these, and in keeping with the parallel between propositions and sets, the ones we prove will prove in a couple of different ways. Let us consider number five, which says that A is a subset of B, if and only if B complement is a subset of A complement. The set theoretical proof of this is certainly doable. Let's assume that A is a subset of B, and let's assume that X is in B complement. Then this means that X is not in B. If X is not in B, then X cannot be in A, because if it were, it would also be in B, because A is a subset of B. But this means that X is in A complement, and we're done. But of course, if we just translate this into propositional language, we see that this is just a contrapositive. We've already proved that. Okay, now let's consider the first statement in this list, and we'll prove it a couple of ways. First, we can consider Venn diagrams. In this case, we can draw A intersect B, then the complement of A intersect B. We can also draw the complement of A and the complement of B and then the picture is going to give us the proof, right? One of these regions is the union of these two regions. If we translate this into propositional language, it becomes the statement not parentheses P and Q is not P or not Q, which we have already proved in the truth table way back. In fact, this is one of De Morgan's laws. Moreover, the first two rules of this theorem are actually called De Morgan's laws for sets because they correspond to De Morgan's laws for logic. Finally, we can look at the sets in detail. If X is in the complement of A intersect B, that means it's not in A intersect B, which means it's not in both A and B at the same time. That means it must be either in A not B, or B not A, or neither. It can't be in both. However, let's think about what the union of A complement and B complement looks like. It can't, any point in there cannot be in both sets because then it wouldn't be in A complement or B complement. Therefore, it cannot be in both and it could be in either one. All these different ways of arguing are permissible. We could use the pictures, we can use statements about sets, and we can translate these into propositional statements. As a general rule, the propositional statements tend to be a little bit cleaner, uh, but any of these are, are acceptable. I'll stop there.